Hey, this is Ernest Rolfson, the CEO and founder of Finexio. Welcome to B2B Cashflow Conversations, the podcast dedicated to sharing insights and innovations in business to business payments, working capital and cash flow management, and fintech entrepreneurship. In each episode, my guest and I tackle questions in the ever evolving world of fintech and payments, an industry that's rapidly evolving and of great interest to investors and businesses alike. Looking forward to having this conversation. David Peterson, he's an e-banking pioneer, is well known for his 30 years as an entrepreneur and content expert on payments for financial services stakeholders. He's uh, the president of US DataWorks, uh, which is now part of Checkalt, uh, a leading provider of integrated receivables. Um, David's also a podcast uh, connoisseur and podcast developer. He runs his own uh, show, Innovation Driven Growth. And um, he, it's clear that uh, in, in listening and getting to know him uh, a bit here, he's, he has a passion for uh, getting businesses and people uh, thinking more about uh, how to spur innovation and, and not only that, but have good decision making. So um, I'm excited to have you on, on the podcast and uh, guest number one. So David, great, great to be with you, man. It's a high honor, Ernest. I, uh, you know what? No one will ever be able to say that they were the first podcast for Finexo, except for me. Nobody. It's amazing. Hopefully, not the first and last. We will. We'll see where this goes. It all we'll, rides. We'll endeavor it to all, make it so. It all rides on this this momentous conversation. No pressure. No pressure. There's every day is the uh, is the Super Bowl. Here. So, you know, that's it. Laces out. <laughs> Laces yeah. out, as they, uh, as they glad say. Glad to be here and, and looking forward to our chat. That's me, t- me too. Uh, uh, so, so why don't we start off by sharing with the listeners what is, you know, U.S. Data Works and Checkalt and what do, what do you guys actually do? Uh, what What's mo- making the sausage move there? And then um, certainly if there's a vision or mission statement or something, that's always interesting. I gotten good coaching and advice on that over the years. Uh, love to hear from uh, you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Checkalt uh, is, it builds itself as the largest independent payment processor in the United States. So most of the payments processors that are out there providing payments to, to billers, to organizations who need to acquire and, and post bills, as well as financial institutions who are trying to acquire deposits, most of them are aligned with one of the big core providers, FIS, Viserv, Jack Henry and all. Uh, Checkall is an independent payments provider. So it gives billers, uh, but more importantly, financial institutions who are supporting billers, a complete suite of products. And Shai Stern, who is our CEO, is a great visionary in our industry. And he likes to call Checkall the house of payments. If there's, if there's something going on with payments that a biller or a bank would need, Shai wants to make sure that we provide it either directly or through the many uh, APIs that we support or through the many third-party relationships that we support. So we try to be a one-stop shop for both traditional paper-based, you know, there's still uh, 15 billion checks written every year. So there's still paper coming in with coupons and so forth. But there's also this push for electronic billing. Checkout wants to wants to basically be the independent provider in that space. That, well, look, the more you do for your customers and partners, the more valuable you are, right? So that's, exactly. that, that exactly. strategy makes, makes a lot of sense. Yes, um, yes. So, and leading with the software is key. Uh, absolutely. It is. It is. Now, you also asked about U.S. DataWorks. So, yeah, uh, please, since, please. 2000, early, since early 2018, I was president of U.S. DataWorks. U.S. DataWorks has a long history as well in payments, uh, but its primary focus is integrated receivables. And not to dive into the minutia of that, but if you think about a traditional business, they now have many different ways that payments come in. And it's, you know, old days, it was like a check and a coupon. So you had all the payment information in the check, all the remittance information in the coupon. It was real easy to match those up, post it to accounting. Now you have many, many different ways that payment can come in. And you have many ways that remittance information might be. So now you have to have something that sort of puts it on. And they're not always connected, right? They're not always connected. Right. So, So over time, companies have reduced the straight through processing of being able to post directly to accounts receivable, you know, from a high of, you know, 90% out of 75, it's 50. And in some cases, companies are down under 40%, meaning a lot of manual effort has to be done to say, oh, this is David's payment and it goes to this account and that's somebody doing that. Well, that's huge 
impact a gross margin because that's cost that's not helping the business grow. It's not doing anything to improve the customer experience. It's just dead, dead cost. So that's what US DataWorks focused on. And the real difference between what Checkall does, which also does integrated receivables, and what US DataWorks is US DataWorks provides an outsourced solution for a financial institution or a biller to be able to do that on their own through our hosted service. Checkall has an outsourced service where they do all of that on behalf of a bank or a biller. Got it. It is, um, you touched on one of the buzzwords in the space, uh, uh, straight through processing there. Is that a kind of holy grail, would you say, for these FIs and, and billers? and? Uh, it absolutely is. And, and this is this is one of the most frustrating things is that there's financial institutions out there, large and small, who have companies that have these kinds of integrated receivables needs, but they don't ever ask questions. Like Think about CEO of bank going to visit CEO of Acme Big Business. Right. And they're having a conversation. Right. When That's, does that turn so to fun to be the fly. It's fun to right, be the fly right. on the wall in that when conversation. Does, when does the banker ever say, hey, what's going on with your accounts receivable? Are you are you seeing that your straight through processing rates have dropped below 40? Right. That conversation never happens. They're talking about loaning They're talking about, money. Golf. They're talking about golf. Uh, anyway, so so this, <laughs> idea, this, this whole idea of how much assistance a financial institution is in a position to bring to their business. Yeah. but never asks the questions that yield yeah. this rich supply of information that the banker then can say, oh, well, we've got these tools that will help you lower costs. And when, when bankers lower the cost of doing business for their business customers, they become very strategic partners. So, so Checkalt- They become uh, sticky. Checkalt is in the business of helping our financial institutions become strategic to their business customers. That's right. That's right. Just- um not to go too much on a tangent here, but because these banks are just so poor at asking these deeper strategic questions on the nuts and bolts, do you see our job here as fintech companies more about taking the decision making away, right, from the bank, mm. and more yeah. of just what if the what if the cert, what if the software and service made the decisions? Because it's just ones and O's and robots, and we know yeah. that. You know what? We oh, there's an opportunity for straight through processing. There's an opportunity yeah. for electronic. So, Ernest, is that you where things are going? It, it is, and and let me separate the the functional aspects of actually getting these associations of billing, you know, payment and remittance information together from the ability of the financial institutions to connect to their business customers who need that service. So, what we've done at Checkall is we've said, look. Every time we have to manually make an exception repair, I don't know what this account number is. Okay, I go through a series of steps and I associate this account number with this, uh, with this payment. Now it, our system learns. You have machine learning or, or artificial intelligence, however you want to say it. So, so now you start to They're beating us at chess. Services. They're right. beating us and at so chess. Now that what's next. creeps back up to 90, you know, 94, 95%. Here's the problem. Even though we can technically do that, it still requires a banker to go to their business customer to ask key questions, to have a, what I call a crucial conversation so that they know and nice. understand that that business, that medical company, that city county government, that utility company, that property management company, they have a need that we can fulfill. We just haven't been asking the question. So, so the technology is exactly as you represent it. It's advancing and doing a lot of things automatically, but bankers still aren't asking those crucial questions. That that's right. Well, I, I think the data can to, can be the way to serve to lead the horse to water, to help them to help them do that. That's it's right. About get, putting that in their hands. That's right. And, um, and, and I'll just say that the outsourcing uh, U.S. DataWorks has a very robust platform. To be honest with you, we were not nearly as successful prior to our acquisition by Checkalt as Checkalt was because Checkalt is outsourcing. A lot of banks now and, and even billers are to the point where they're just like. We don't we don't want to touch. We don't want the mail to come into us. We don't want to open envelopes. We don't want to touch it. And so that the, the sure appetite don't. for outsourcing is huge. Now it come, you know, come into February of 2020. And what did we have? A global pandemic. So how did people feel even more so at that point about physically touching envelopes? Right back in those early days, they weren't really sure how the virus was being transmitted. So, so the appetite for, for people to come in and say, here's a professional organization that has operation sites all over the United States so that wherever you are, we've got the ability to take your physical mail, bring it in, process it, and give you files that post 
to your bank and post to your accounting system. And then, then further, let's take all of the things that you're getting in paper and how can we help you convert that to electronic? How do we help you make that transition so that instead of it just being paper until the last check rolls through the system in year 2073 or whatever, now we're actually giving them the ability to migrate that over to electronic, which further reduces their, their uh, costs, improves their gross margin. That's right. That's right. Well, I mean, one of the things uh, uh, in parallel, I mean, right, my company, uh, Finexio, is about helping companies make and deliver payments. And as much pain as it is uh, for the suppliers or payees or near world, these billers, right, about you can't be sending people in the office right now to collect checks. You, you can't do it. It's got to be electronic. It's not safe. And we've seen, I mean, I sp- spent this last week with three companies over $300 million in revenue sending people in just to deal with checks. And on our side, they're sending people in to print and mail checks right now. That's crazy. And so I think the pain is higher than ever um, on both the receiving and the sending side. And, um, you know, we've got, uh, you know, a robot being controlled with an iPhone. They're crawling around on the moon. <laughs> right. Yeah, right. Right. We can, we can, we Mars. We can, sorry, Mars. We're we on Mars, Mars now. Mars. I'm, in, I'm in. Sorry, I, for, I thought I was in 1964 for a minute. I I uh, I uh, better take another sip of coffee. We're in 2021. No, We're on Mars now. This is, and Ernest, you make the you make the great point. How, how is, is it? How is it, now? how is it that we can see a beautiful high definition picture of the landscape of Mars, and yet the landscape of payments? For both on the accounts receivable and your world, the accounts payable side is still in 1973. How's how does that happen? Um, look, banks are not technology companies, as we know. As we know, um, that's where people, nice people like me and you, come into play. We have to help. And, and, and let me just have to help. Let me them. be very clear. Let me be very clear. I, I am not disparaging financial institutions at all. These these are folks who who perform an incredibly valuable service in their Absolutely. Communities. They are is super important. They are so important, uh, especially to business customers where they're getting credit to expand their business, you know, build sure. new buildings, bring on new people and, and do all of these payment things. What, what they really haven't done, when you think about large banks, you know, the, the Bank of America, Wells Fargo, City Chase, and so forth. Yep. Yep. And then you think of all of these thousands of small community banks everywhere. The companies like Checo are there to provide that, that downstream you know, thousands and thousands of banks, the ability to do things that might otherwise be very expensive for them to do. Yeah. And we basically take on and do they don't have the scale. So we're, yeah. To we're we're not kind of saying that they're not capable. We're not saying they're not paying attention. We're saying, let us come alongside you and provide the pieces that are missing so that you can offer an incredibly strategic service to your customer and we'll do all the work. You're uh, a known speaker and an influencer around innovation and in financial services. I mean, is it hard? Is what is fundamentally, in your view, with some of these banks we're talking about and uh, smart people, good people? Is there a barrier around innovation within these these those four walls that you think we should know or talk about or tease out here? Is there something real or what? Why is this? There's this explosion in fintech. Right. I mean, why banks, they have all the business, they have all the money, they have all the relationships. Why are what what's going on? Yeah, it's it's incredibly hard to be a bank. Uh, a, a few years ago, the OCC opened up a fintech charter and there was worry that, you know, dozens or hundreds of fintechs were going to go be banks. I think maybe one went forward. To be. It is really hard to go through all the process and, and, and be a bank. And as somebody who uh, owned a started a software company years ago, Goldleaf Technologies, that was a wholly owned subsidiary of a bank, I know how difficult it is to actually operate as a fintech and be a part of a bank holding company. There's just rules and regulations that limit your ability to truly be innovative, right? So your, your initial question was, are, 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 is there a barrier right, yeah. to, to banks being innovative? Banks are incredibly tradition bound, incredibly tradition bound. In fact, I, I'm going to throw this out there, Ernest. I don't know if, if this is- Let's go crazy. To your, oh, let's I don't know go if crazy. Deal, but I, I Here we working, go. I was working- I'm on the board of uh, Payments First, a nonprofit payment association based in Atlanta. We were talking about the conference and we're a uh, September conference. What kind of speakers do I? I said, you know what we need? We need a funeral home director to come give a talk. And they're like, what? That's a great business. What are you talking about? Funeral. What are you funeral talking about? It's a great what business. That's a I great said, business. I said, here's what's happening. I have some friends who own the funeral. Proof. 
and, and we were sitting there talking about business and innovation, whatever. And, and think about another business besides banking that's pretty tradition bound. It's probably funeral homes, right? And so I was asking my friend about it. He said, David, he said, our customers have completely and totally changed. I'm thinking, what are you talking about? Dead people or dead people? He goes, no, 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 no. That, that's not our customers. Those are our product. Our product is services for dead people. Our customers are those that are left behind making decisions about what's going to happen with the dead people. So, so those now are young Gen Xs, they're millennials, and, and maybe even in some cases, some older, older Gen Zs. So the way that they have to pitch their services, the, the model in which they talk about all the business of funeral homes has now completely changed. Even a lot of the things they're doing in funeral services are changing based on this changing demographic. They understand that they cannot stay pat if their customers are, are getting younger and moving, so must their marketing, so must their services. And so I think this is the parallel that banks see. They are still focused on those customers that make them the most money, which are primarily baby boomers, right? People of, of my generation. Um, but we're, we're getting older and unfortunately dying at the rate of 10,000 a day now, baby boomers. So the future for financial institutions are young Gen Xs and millennials and, and eventually Gen Zs. They're the ones that are going to start companies. They're the ones that are going to have different types of payment needs. And yet most financial institutions aren't sort of skating to the puck, to use a Wayne Gretzky term. They're not, they're not letting their innovation move. I have a rule. That those I have a, we need to have at least one Wayne Gretzky quote in every well, there podcast. So, so, that, so we, that we you, started it right here. That was it. Yep. That was it. Yeah, so you did but, it. but a bank, part of a banks don't want to be on the bleeding edge. They don't want to be pioneers because pioneers are dead people with arrows in their back facing west. So, so they, there has to be a way. <laughs> there has to be a way. That's what they think of. So there has to be a way that if innovation, if they can start down a path of innovation as these customers, right? There'll, there'll be an intersection. Of I need my three D glasses right now to yeah. see that. Yeah. To see the. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But 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 uh, uh, some banks some banks are getting it. You're seeing some financial institutions out there that are being very proactive in terms of working with fintechs. You're seeing a lot of banks move yeah. towards this idea of banking as a service or payments as a service instead of the traditional way of banking. But by and large, banking really fundamentally has not changed much, even in the face of a, a great deal changing, especially as it relates to faster payment options. Sure. Well, they're going to have to figure out to do something with these uh, all these branches sitting there. They can't all turn them into San Francisco coffee shops like our uh, friends at Cap One. Nope. And, um, and, and by the way, I have I have a whole series of content on branch transformation, perhaps for another time, another day. OK, OK. Uh, I know a thing or two about that, but uh, you probably know a lot more than me. Well, I, I, I think uh, the thing you heard it here first, folks, is we're going to soon be uh, shopping for funeral home services via Instagram influencers. Uh, that's where things are going. That's what the kids are into these days. Um, but no, look, I mean, same thing, the same thing as a funeral home needs to innovate and, and communicate to a new generation. FIs need it, you know, they need to actually, I think, distribute their services and products through software, which is a way that, you know, if you think about the office of the CFO, the CFO suite, he or she is using accounting packages. They're using accounts payable software, accounts receivable software. They, the financial services need to be embedded within the software that's how people are making decisions now. They're not just calling right. up their banker and saying, oh, what product can you give me or whatever. They're like, they want to use software to make their business go. And in a really good example of that, which, which I'm sure relates to both uh, our accounts receivable side, your accounts payable side, is, is the more that we can automate it, then, then these things that are normal, the things that work the way they're supposed to work are automated. Nobody has to look at them. Nobody has to touch them. But in that instance, when all of a sudden there's something that's a little bit awry, when something goes sideways, the exception. Now, how can how can somebody have a high touch uh, reality, right? And so now that's where you start thinking about chat. You start thinking about you know other other ways of interactive video, and, and just like we're chatting here and on video, um, you know some some financial institutions have gone to video tellers, but but this idea of being able to get the expert in the bank. On a little video chat, who helps me with a particular vexing problem, and you know why did my ACH file didn't do this, or some you know some particular issue, the billing file, um, you know, uh, uh, didn't go out like it was supposed to. And now I've got the ability to actually, you know, like I've got a whiteboard right here. So if I was doing some kind of support, I might be able to draw a diagram, whatever. There's a there's a I lot do it all day long. Engaging, 
right? So, so that's where you know we as technology companies uh, are are in in that mode, and so must I think the financial institutions then say we can automate all of this, and then we'll offer a high touch experience if you have a vaccine problem. Yeah, I mean, I mean, so um, I mean, I, I think where I want to go with that is like we it's these technologies aren't even the emerging technologies, but these are the technologies that I think are, are influencing the roadmap for financial services and, um, and are going to be embedded into the processes, but we're only at the very infancy stages of that. In my, in my opinion, I don't know if you have a different idea. Yeah. Maybe, uh, maybe I, there's more investment around SMB right now, but like I live in upper middle market. I'm dealing with a couple hundred million dollar manufacturer. No bank is calling. There's no innovation. It's all paper. That's all paper. And now the SMB has more technology than the company that's moving hundreds of millions of dollars. It's ama- it's amazing. And it is it is exactly it is exactly the way uh, the way that you say it, it, it is it is a situation where um, as companies move forward in a continuum of their growth, and, and especially think about somebody who's twenty seven years old decides they want to start a business and they go to their hometown bank. Maybe this is where their dad and grandfather bank type of thing. And they go in there and they start talking about things. And they say, well, we're going to be taking payments from Zelle. And, uh, you know, eventually we're going to need to send uh, some o- overseas ACH with uh, IATs. And, and, and the person that they're talking to is literally clueless. Like they don't understand these words. What, what, what are these things of which you speak? That's where the person lo- doesn't get, maybe give them another chance. They're like, you know what? Right. This bank isn't, isn't forward thinking enough to be uh, to be up to speed on what these things are, and now they go to some other large financial institution because they think that's the only place they can get. So my important point is this: it's not enough for banks and credit unions to have the technology and the payment services that they need. They have to be competent in delivering that story. They have to be able to explain not only that they have it, but why it's important for you maybe to use this to be in a consultative mode on it. And so that's another big piece is, is that to, to really sort of sell, you have to be a good storyteller. And, and, and bankers traditionally have not been in the storytelling yeah. business. Yeah. And, and that's another big factor as well. You know, the way that I, uh, I don't know that I was taught this way. I, w- I was trained in solution selling, right, formally, right? And, and you're selling ephemeral. I was at MasterCard, right? So what do you, you're a network. How do you sell somebody a network? Right. You know what I mean? It's so it's this very right. ephemeral, very, mm-hmm. you know, like what is your problem? Oh, you have a pain point. Okay. Well, what if we could do X, Y, and Z and it solves it? Oh, uh, really? That would solve your pain point? Turns out we do that actually. We can string all this together and you kind of, that's how you lead the horse to water. Um, that part of that is storytelling, but I think that, you know, the more you can create that emotional connection, with the companies you're trying to help and paint them a vision, the stronger and more valuable the relationship becomes around what could, in, in our world, look, moving money, that's a commodity. You can get right. ACH, you can get check, you can get wires from any number of places, right? And so it's a question of who do you work with? You work with someone that's knowledgeable, that's a trusted advisor, that has deep insight into your business, but can make that connection around what your business objectives are, uh, and the pain and the the feelings you want to have in the future about what will it feel like using my product and working with me. What kind of experience do you want to have? Right. And I and I've never I've never been delighted. Uh, how delighted have you been when you walked into the bank branch or something like that? Right? There's no. It's, it's a, a lack of delight. It's a, it's a lack of That's delight. Right. That's right. Um, uh, it is. There is no question. And I will just use check all as an example. Uh, if if a, if a financial institution goes to a vendor and says, hey, this is what I want to do. I need I need to offer lockbox for 24 of my best, most profitable customers. I need to be able to do some type of electronic bill payment and presentment. And, and I want all that integrated together in a in a package. And, and a lot of companies say, yeah, we have that. And it's very structured and standardized. This is the way it works. Yeah. It's what a, you yeah. see at check all what you see at check all is more along the lines of having conversations with this financial institution and learning about some unique things that some of these companies are doing and then using the tools that we have to basically create something that's standardized in terms of our ability to run it on the back end, but really gets tailored to what any individual customer needs. And I think that's that's the same model. That because we do that, we wind up having 
um, longevity. A lot of companies that stay with us for years and years yep. and years. Yeah. Just you know, maybe somebody else came along and said, "Hey, we can do this for you for a nickel cheaper or whatever else." But they yep. they know what kind of of service um, yep. that checkoff represents, and so so that's the same thing we're looking for. Is if I walk into a bank and I say, "Hey, I'm looking for a payroll account." Uh, I need to be able to pay my folks. And immediately they open up the big fan full brochure that has all of the checks of how you can do uh, write payroll checks, right? Well, wait a second. I didn't say anything about checks. I just said I, I needed a payroll account. So immediately I should be thinking ACH. ACH credit should be the way that, that those goes. It's just that different of thinking of listening to what somebody says and then understanding more what they mean. I, they only know what they know. We they should only, be the experts to know what they need and help them exactly come right. up with a solution that, that fits their needs. That's exactly right. Now, I mean, what you're doing at Checkalt um, around more of a, I don't want to say custom solution. I want to say the right solution for the right customer versus an out tailored. of the box. Tailored. tailored. That's exactly right. It's a tailored right. solution. A Savile Row style That's solution. That's right. Um, bespoke. Uh, bespoke. Bespoke. <laughs> Um, is, uh, no, I mean, it's, it's, that's what gets you in with the customers. And I think for payments and we've looked, we've seen this in uh, merchant services, merchant acquiring, it's a commodity. Now it's just a commodity and you can get credit card processing from a hundred different places and you can always get it for a nickel cheaper. You know, those guys have had to learn a hard lesson and, and the best players, the stripes of the world, the brain trees have realized that they've got to go with custom API integrations into software platforms. And there's a unique stickiness factor. There's something around helping manage the data flow. It's, so it can't be about, can I just get it one nickel cheaper? Can I get a few more basis points? It's you've got to work with people that know and understand your business and are willing to invest and do something unique. And that's the mistake I see companies making is thinking, you know what, this is just a commodity. I can just, I can call up 50 different banks and get virtual card better, more, more, more rev share. And it's like, a hundred percent of zero is zero. You got to work with people that are going to help you enable the growth here. It's just so you, is, I'm uh, preaching I'm to chuckling. the choir. <laughs> I'm chuckling because this is so real for me right now. One of the things that I'm doing is is really focusing on our check business, our traditional paper items, you know, that come in. It's dying the slowest so, death. And, and, and some people have just completely written it off. And there's still about 15 billion checks that get written every year. Yep. And so, you know, people are go, well, back in 97, it was 55 billion checks. But if you didn't know that, <laughs> and I just told you there were 15 billion checks, you'd go, that's a oh, big that's number. A lot of checks. That's a lot of checks. So a lot of people are abandoning this business. A lot of, of, of companies that were traditionally in-house because of their volume now are 65% of volume or 40% of volume you know, or 70% of volume. So there's a more and more need for focus on these checks. And here's the big number, two big numbers, 526. That's the average amount in dollars of checks back in 1997, $526 average check. 2020? It was, or I, th I think actually 2019 might be the last published numbers, over $2,600. So what's happened is, is as those small dollar payments have been eliminated by, you know, PayPal and other forms of uh, ACH and other electronic payments, yep. Yep. what's left is a lot of B2B payments, which are large and are very important to quickly and accurately get posted to accounts receivable. So that company has money to pay people and sure. buy supplies and grow their business. So so that's, again, where Checkalt comes in and says, if you if your check business is such where you really would just like to outsource it to somebody and let us take it on and all we do is send a deposit to your bank and a file goes directly to your accounts receivable to post, um, then that's that's the model that we feel there's a renaissance period now for these these paper items. In some cases, you still have coupons. You might have what like a stub. You get a full yeah, page and tear that, off the bottom. Fun remittance. Yeah, you know, we send them all we of send that. Them here. All of that. All of that stuff is still very, very active. And um, e even though checks still are declining, the rate of decline has really slowed a lot. So there's still many, many years left of active check business. And Checkout just wants, I don't know, uh, what would Shai say? He just wants half of it. He, he does, He's not a greedy person. So <laughs> seven and a half billion, we'll take seven and a half sure. billion checks. Sure. And we'll be fine. That's fine. That that works send for us, me. We'll, we'll have signs out there say, send us your checks. We'll you know, well, you know, one of the things we would say at MasterCard, you know, uh, a billion here and a, and a billion there and soon you're talking real money, <laughs> you know, so it's uh, it's fine. Um, 
That that's cool. So we're now now that we uh, now that we are where we are. I mean, um, there's been a lot of acceleration due to 2020 and the changes we've seen in COVID. I mean, is this going to continue here? Do you have any kind of predictions about this? Is this going to slow down? Or I mean, this is this has undoubtedly been a help for your business. I would imagine. It has. Uh, no question. No question. Here's what I would say. I would say that we are not going to go back to what things were in the fourth quarter of 2019. Sure. I, I don't think there's any like, okay, everyone's vaccinated or we got herd immunity or whatever. And it goes back. I think enough time, like people's behaviors change when you Your do brain changes. A way, right. You, you reorient towards that. So are we going to continue doing things in 2022 like we did in 2020? No. But, you know, the phrase that you hear is new normal. And so I do believe there'll be a new normal, but the new normal has really spurred, let's, let's call it financial institutions and uh, billers and organizations that may not have been as uh, forward thinking relative to how they view the future of payments and faster payments and other forms of payments. And because of COVID, we're sort of forced into thinking about that. So they're not going to go back. I think there's there's the, there's still a renaissance for those high value checks, but the opportunities now to actually capture new types of payments as we go forward. And you see RTP being advanced by the clearinghouse, and now the Federal Reserve has has got a pending uh, faster payment called Fed Now that uh, would be out in 2023, maybe 2024. Uh, there's going to be other third-party uh, payment uh, providers out there uh, doing things. There's there's an appetite now for the ability to, uh, to uh, quickly and securely capture and make payments. Let's just call it push credits. I need to push a credit to earnest. And, and there are a number of use cases, both on the consumer side and the business side, as well as the consumer to business side, where an instant payment with two parties that don't know each other, but that is not going through the card networks could be very valuable. And I think that's where, that's where you know, really examining those use cases and then a banker going to businesses they know would, would follow those use cases can now tell a story. Understood. Since you touched on it, faster payments, I get asked this question uh, a, a lot, actually. Uh, investors and folks are always like, is faster payments going to kill virtual cards and eliminate the card rails and all this stuff? And mm -hmm. and I'm like, well, from where I sit, I've been asked uh, exactly zero times by customers, CFOs, big companies in the last five years about faster payments. So I see zero customer demand from where I sit. And, you know, I work with right. companies that are like 100 right. million in revenue to billion in revenue. Uh, I, right. We're plugged into large procurement software that have thousands of customers. Not a single one is asked about faster payments, right. but it comes right. up a lot. Is this disrupting anything? I mean, is this just, uh, are we just going to charge people a little bit more money to get an ACH a little bit faster? Is that really just what we're talking about here? Because that's <laughs> my opinion, but I'm just one. You know, one yeah. payment schlub. What do I know? I'm, you know. So you hit it right on the head. So Finexio is is is, is dominating this world of of, uh, of automated payments, right? Payables, right? How you're automating all of the payables, right? Absolutely. So here's a company. Here's a company. They want to schedule and make their payments, and they may also have certain things that they've tied into their accounting system, as well as their financial institution for things like positive pay, you know, uh, fraud prevention. Uh, it, you know, a whole bunch of stuff that they have built around this idea that a check with a check number made out to a specific payee with a specific amount, uh, you know, with, you know, all of that gets tied into all of these other systems. And then somebody comes along and says, well, wait, why don't you just send that through a faster payment? And it's like, you know, just converting the check itself to a faster payment is really easy. What's not easy is now making sure that all of those other systems that you had for fraud prevention, for management of accounts payables, for, for, the, uh, for the way that information is flowing between accounts payable systems and the ERP, the, the accounting system of record, or, or the bank. In other words, all of those things have to come together in order for you to say, I'm going to replace this check as an outbound payment from a business to another, uh, probably to another business. So, so the, the way I would say it is, is that if you went to, it's like, why, why isn't any, any uh, CFOs asking Ernest about this? It's because they've got a system that works. They know when and That's how right. they're making their payments. And so what's the use case? What's the business case for yeah. somebody who's a manufacturer to say, I have to send money to somebody and I have to do it right now. So I have one. 
I have one. I'm going to share it with you. You probably don't have any we've gold got, that do We've this. got the this gold is, right here, folks. You're hearing it first. Here it is. Here it is. Uh, a rancher in Texas rolls up to a stockyard. Are you and, from? And are you from Texas? Are you? Texan? I am not. Oh, I'm you're not. Not. I, oh, you're not. I was born and raised in Florida, and I live in Georgia. Oh, this great. rancher, rancher from Texas rolls up to a stockyard with a big with a bunch of trailers. He's going to buy a hundred head of cattle. Uh, he does not have a previous relationship with the stockyard. He picks out his hundred head of cattle, and he owes them. Let's pick a number: two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Now, before he drives away with a hundred cows. The stockyard wants to know that they have good funds of $250,000 because he's going to leave with the cows, right? It's not something he arranged ahead of time. He didn't arrange for credit ahead of time. He's going there and saying, I'll buy these cows and I need to do something so that you can see that you've got $250,000 in your accounts as good funds. Cash is king, as they say. That's it. So, so he obviously doesn't have $250,000 in cash. So that ability for him not to have a previous relationship with this company, yeah. but still affect a payment within a reasonable period of time. Sure, and there sure. are similar examples on the consumer side, right? Where a consumer wants to buy something at a garage sale and it's more money they can get from the ATM, but they're not going to take your check. You're from California and the, you know you happen to be visiting your sister in Georgia, whatever. I mean, there was a lot of use cases where it would be really helpful if I could push a credit to you and you knew that you had the funds Secure. So going back to your earlier question, a lot of these models, like the RTP model, the Fed now faster payments model, require the financial institutions to integrate with their core system to give those systems access real time to somebody's available balance to know whether or not they can fund those payments and similarly to credit somebody for the receipt of those payments. I think that there's a lot of opportunity in the EFT POS rails. Um, we're all those, using all those these buy now, pay later right. deals that push, are blowing up. Right, right. The, the idea that I can world. that I can push you a credit that that without us having to have a previous relationship or even be on the same app, that I could push you a credit through the debit rails, and you would see it because you would look at your online banking through your mobile and see that seven hundred fifty dollars had shown up to your account from David Peterson. That has legs, and I think you're going to find that for a lot of faster payment scenarios. <clears throat> Whereas RTP, I think it's going to be great as it rolls out and eventually replaces some wires on the B2B side. Um, it's it's wires a little are, bit expensive be... and, and it's it's a little bit more difficult to see it as a day in and day out sort of P2P solution. Right, right, right. So really, if, if there is a loser, perhaps in real time, it, um, it would probably be the wires that that's the only way to get same day today. But it's if you're charging right. you 20 bucks, 50 bucks. That's it's right. Time. That's right. Done manually. Yeah. Cut yeah. off. And, and again, banks banks look at that. How many wires they do and the wire income, and they think, well, how much is it going to cost us to go do something else like RTP? It that's a you know that's a decision point they have. Yeah, these are um, turns out these are businesses. Uh, and remember when Do uh, when the um, uh, was it Dodd Frank? I guess right when they kind of had the Durbin Amendment to Dodd Frank, and they reduced right. the debit interchange down dramatically right. and had a ten billion dollar right. issuer cap. Uh, banks increased all their small business checking fees and ATM fees, and people right. were shocked. Right. Oh, these banks, they're evil. They're charging consumers. It's like, well, uh, there was yeah. just some regulation that took away yeah. billions of dollars of their revenue. Yeah, and, so, and to be fair, I, I've said this all the time. Banks are different than any other kind of business, right? So, so to me, banks aren't any different than the dry cleaners. You go to the dry cleaners, you take your suit, no. and they do a, a valuable service, and you get your suit back. You pay them, you know, twelve fifty, and you're happy about it. You give your bankers your money, and they perform a valuable service. But if they try to charge you three dollars for it, 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 it's all of a sudden like, what? you know, like people are ready it's to an outrage. It's an outrage. So people think about their money differently than any other product service. So banks and, and credit unions really do have it tough simply because people don't look at the way that banks provide service like they would any other vendor. Hey, it's you tough. know what? Yeah. I mean, look, it is not free to move money. It costs money to move money, as we know. And these checks, these checks are costing like $16 a check to move. Yeah. Right. Somebody's got to make a uh, make a profit here, you know. And um, look, the more we move to digital, the more money we can save, and the more we can make together, and the better it is for everybody. You know, everybody. And, wins. And, 
Again, that's that's why the strategy of Checkalt isn't to say we're going to be all electronic because to go to a business and say that's we're going to be all electronic, it is it it's is not realistic. Possible to do. It's Let's securely, securely and safely process your checks and then work collaboratively with you to move those checks over to electronic payments. That's the right strategy. Hey, look, half of my business is uh, we're checks. We're printing and mailing checks for companies, but I can send those checks with robots. I don't have to have people sending those checks. So I'm helping, you know, Amherst College um, or, you know, Morgan and Morgan, the law firm where they're printing and mailing checks with people. And I'm like, you know what? I can kill half your checks, put those to digital and the rest I'll use a robot to print. Right. Everyone's happy. Everyone saves, yep. you know, there you go. And as the check alts of the world and others come in and help us further digitize that life will be good. Right, I agree. It's one of those one of those things. So um, back to your example, real quick. I know we got to wrap up here shortly. Were those uh, were those meat cows or were those leather cows? The guy in Texas. I wanted. I didn't. That didn't come up in no. Because no. those were, were what was it? Ten yeah. cows at two hundred fifty k. So those were yeah. Those were meat cows. Those were Texas long. Yeah, this, this is kind of like the the Kobe like high end Kobe beef. You know, a lot of marbling. Marb, it's about the marbling. Well, you, it's not just the marbling. You have to massage them as well with the with See, the, just, the just olive oil. It, it's the very first podcast. You're going to be getting actually uh, messages in from people in Texas. Like, wait a second, the cows don't cost that much. I, I want to know. We we went. My wife and I went to New Zealand, and uh, that's where you're right. There's more sheep than people. And uh, we said, it'd be awesome to move here along with Peter Thiel and have our own sheep farm. So I started doing research then on how much it costs to buy these uh, buy these sheep. And uh, uh, it's not that much money. You can get a bunch of sheep. The, ter- the harder part is the land. So That's you got to right. get the land. That's right. So, so, um, so I guess, uh, I guess two, two things here is where, is where kind of before we go, I guess, you, you know, look, you've, you've been in this space a while. You've, you've started companies, you've been running companies, you've got a innovation driven growth podcast. I mean, what's some of the, um, you know, what's some of the, I guess, if you have a big interesting learning over the past few years or over your career, what has that been? around that it could be about the space it could be something else mm-hmm. um what what is something that uh and i'll have a follow-up around this but um uh anything impactful yeah. uh it's it's amazing because i i actually work with some uh young people who are starting companies and uh and, and you know it, unfortunately millennials have been sort of cast with a broad brush that they you know that they 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 don't have uh, they they never they've never had to experience any kind of adversity. They're they they've been handed everything. Everybody got a trophy, and you know that that's that's obviously a gross uh, exaggeration. But what I will say is is that there is there is great learning and failure. There's a lot of people who want to start out and do something and don't really have an appreciation for the value of mistakes. The value of mistakes. So when I talk about innovation, innovation comes from creativity, but creativity isn't innovation. To get creative, you got to come up with ideas. Everyone's trying to think of good ideas. Maybe they're trying to think of great ideas, and it's a huge mistake. Stop trying to think of good ideas. Just come up with ideas. So somebody, you know, I'm speaking at a conference. Somebody comes up afterwards and says, "Hey, David, um, you know, I'm struggling, you know, to, to to come up with some good ideas. You know, what's the what's the secret?" And I say, "Well, how many bad ideas have you come up with this month?" And they're like. What, what are you talking about? I, I, I'm not trying to come up with bad ideas. I said, I, exactly. That's your problem. If you try to come up with a good idea, you're, you're struggling. All you got to do is come up with ideas. Because what happens is, is bad ideas, uh, meaning that they're just not feasible or it, it, doesn't, you know, it doesn't work, whatever. But bad ideas spur more ideas. When I do group um, uh, brainstorming, one person throws out something. It's crazy, but nobody ridicules them. And, but somebody in their head goes, oh, that's a crazy idea. But you know what wouldn't be crazy? And they think of something that they now say that they would never have thought of but for the, quote, crazy idea. So we have to stop stifling ideas. If anyone ever in any company throws out something that says, oh, that's a crazy idea, that's a bad idea, whatever, they are literally stifling innovation keeping that person from coming up with other ideas. And so if somebody comes up with an idea and it's nuts, and then their fifth idea is really wacko and their 15th idea is just out of this world, you know, maybe their 25th idea is something that all of a sudden saves the company $2 million a year. We, we have got to stop this, this whole thing of we're going to get around and think of a good idea. Harvest ideas, collect all ideas, then work those, massage those, 
It might be the seed of idea. Give it some, give it some good soil and some water and some sun and let it blossom into the fruit of innovation. Hey, I, I look, the way that I started Finexio and created now like 50 jobs is because I was tired of having so many great ideas at a big company that we couldn't do anything about. We couldn't act on them. Everyone was like, oh, that's not We were at a big company. We said, hey, why don't we partner with Uber or Lyft and help transport sick and elderly people to their medical providers? And we were told, oh, that'll never work. Now that health, they've got healthcare divisions now at Uber right. and Lyft. Right. So I was like, you know what? Let's let's go. Let's go do this on our own. Let's go find find a path on our own if I can't get the ideas done here. So I, I completely agree with you. Um, and I guess lastly, I mean, that the, we call the show really paying it forward. Um, it is a play on words that we're in the payment space. But anything you would share in terms of advice around, um, you know, you being on the front line in payments, maybe it's someone, maybe it's a fellow entrepreneur, someone starting their company, or maybe it's other players in the space. What what kind of advice would you have uh, to some of our listeners? Um, it could be anything in this in this area. Well, but Here's what I'd say. If, if you're a parent out there or an aunt, uncle, you know, you have nieces and nephews, you have ch- children, and if you want them to have the potential for an entrepreneurial future, then I think there's two very important things. Number one, let them be entrepreneurial early. Let them have yard, you know, yard sales or, or sell lemonade or uh, paper route, or I don't even know if they have those anymore. Uh, you know, uh, go around and mow lawns. So. Anything they can do that's entrepreneurial as a young person is gold. And the second thing is, is let them ask questions. Don't stop stifling children from asking questions. Yes, I know it can be annoying, you know, and so forth, but you have to allow them to question the world and then provide meaning. But don't give them, you know, platitudes and, and, and you know, uh, uh, pony, t- uh, <laughs> uh, uh, what do you call it, unicorns and, and rainbows. Talk to them in reality about some things that are tough. It is difficult. You know, talk to them about experiences, but answer and let them ask um, good questions. And then to my friends in the financial services industry, if you work at a bank and credit union, I would ask you to think about this. There are literally millions of potential customers right now who are coming into the workplace who would never, ever, ever think that they need to have an account at a bank or credit union. They don't even consider that you exist. They don't, they don't have any need. They don't, they don't, they don't feel like you exist for any purpose that's for them. So, so don't sit there and think that they're going to need you and then come into your beautiful lobby to ask about accounts. You are going to have to proactively help them understand why having a relationship with a primary banker is really, really important. Uh, a bunch of millennials had businesses that they weren't doing anything with banks. And then PPP loans came out. And guess who was delivering PPP loans? Fintechs. The bankers. The bankers. Oh, well, then, no. like, you put the actual loan, you have to have a bank account. So now they're scrambling. They're that, trying you to did. Out you did. I, that is true. How do, you, how do you get a PPP? So so we need to be able to tell those stories and help them understand why it's important for them to have a yeah. primary banking relationship. So th- that's my advice. You know what? They they do serve a purpose. You need someone to hold the money and they're licensed and regulated to do that safely and securely. And that's pretty that's important. Right. You know, so they're going to they're gonna stay relevant for a while. Well, look, uh, this has been uh, a lot of fun. We got some Gretzky quotes. We did some time traveling. We talked about beef and leather cows. We got some uh, parental advice thrown in for good measure. Um, a whirlwind a tour de force, if you will, David. Where can we kind of, where do you lurk? Where can we find more yes. about your yes. learning. If, if, if you would like to reach out to me, uh, I'm at david.peterson, P E T E R S O N, at checkalt.com, C H E C K A L T.com. And if you want to know more about uh, innovation driven growth, you can actually go out to davidpeterson.com, and there's a link on davidpeterson.com that will get you to uh, a book that I've written and the uh, podcast. And a lot of other, I, I have a, a lot of information out there on social media. I'm everywhere on social media, media as DLP speaks, with the exception of Facebook, which for some reason I'm DP speaks. So uh, I, I, I would welcome anybody who wants to contact me and share uh, information or say, hey, you're crazy about the cows, or you know, let's talk about financial services or innovation or whatever's on your mind. Look, this has been a lot of fun, great conversation, and uh, uh, looking forward to to keep it in touch and keep fighting the good fight together. Awesome. Ernest, thank you so much.
A pleasure, man. Take care. Thanks for listening to B2B Cashflow Conversations. This is Ernest Rolfson, the CEO and founder of Finexio. I welcome your questions and comments. You can reach me at podcast at finexio.com. You can also find us on Twitter at Finexio Payments. To subscribe, you can go to finexio.com forward slash podcast. Be sure to check out my new episodes on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you listen to podcasts. Thanks and talk with you again soon.